All right, what I want to do in this video is basically circle back and pick up the, the stuff in chapter four that, uh, and try to bring some, you know, completeness to what's going on here because it, it, it can get a bit overwhelming. So just to quickly review, we've, we've kind of, we've talked about, um, for the first part of the course, we talked a lot about employment income and then we realized, okay, so that's, that's different from business income. Um, and how is it different? Well, employment income is, is the taxation of it is somewhat simpler because it's really just a receipt by the employee and we'll tax that amount. And there may be some other things that we want to include that aren't included as cash. Or there may be some things that we want to allow them to deduct when their employer um, kind of forces them to pay for things. But other than that, it's very straightforward. Whereas business income is, you know what, we need to figure out what the revenues are and what the expenses are and, and then we'll tax that net number. So then we came along and we said, okay, uh, we need to spend a lot of time thinking about whether something, a transaction, when, when, when a company sells an asset, whether that generates business income or it generates a capital gain. So again, we've got the same word, business income, business income, and uh, does it mean exactly the same thing in both of those contexts? And now we're going to introduce a third one. So we want to consider in 4035 in, in Chapter 4, business income versus property income. So first of all, we want to keep them somewhat um, separate but together in our minds. Business income really is this thing that, that we want to tax as business income. And uh, so the first distinction, business income versus employment income, is a, is a, a large scale one. So you are one or the other and we will tax you differently based on the nature of the income that you're earning. Business income versus capital gain, same thing. The, whole, the Income Tax Act says you cannot have a deduction um, for a, a, a loss that's capital in nature, or you can't have, you have to include the full amount in income if it's an income transaction and, and only 50% if it's a capital transaction. So that's where those distinctions arise. Now, with business income versus property income, what we're really getting at here is this idea of active versus passive. So property is, you know, just something that you own for the sake of generating passive income. So think of things like interest and dividends and royalties, uh, rent, okay, and there's others, but that, so it's not exhaustive. But let's think about royalties, right? It, the reason that the income is considered passive is once you own the patent, all you have to do to earn income is have other people use that and send you royalty payments. And so there's not an activeness to it. Now, why does it matter? Why does this distinction matter? Well, as you see in, in uh, 4035, it matters because there's this idea that active income has is, is different in nature. So for corporations, we're, we put different rates on it, so different tax rates on passive and, and active, and especially for small businesses, this is a, a big deal in Canada. And then also, let's just generically say different consequences. So for an individual, for instance, if you have passive income, that will not generate RSP room, whereas, um, so actually, let me refer you in the book, why does it matter? This is covered, there's more reasons than this given, but there's just, there, it, it does matter. So for corporations, again, most of the corporations that we look, that we think about are active businesses. They're generating revenue um, through what we consider a, a business process that is active. But there are companies out there that all they do is they own shares or they own um, patents or they own whatever. And, and, and so it's, it's um, it is passive. And so if the principal purpose of uh, the company is to earn income from property, so passive income, then it's considered um, passive, okay, or inactive, same thing. Unless so we have a big unless here, the company employs more than five full-time employees. 
Okay, so basically there's this way out for, for companies that who, whose primary purpose is to um, just earn, own things and collect uh, rent or, or royalties, etc. You can be considered a full-fledged active business if you are of the scale that you're employing five full-time people. Okay. Also, important to note here that really, though, this distinction is made at the transaction level, not just the company level. So just note, active companies, so the, even though the company's primary primary purpose is active, um, it can still earn. So active corporations can earn, sorry about my writing, I'll get better, inactive income, and it will be treated separately unless with exceptions okay so this is really what we want to take away here it matters um, but for our purposes when we look at these companies we'll basically be looking at either an active business and for the most part that's all we look at but there are businesses out there who need to pass this five full-time employees rule okay the rest of this is going to be uh, kind of a bit jumpy until um, we get to the, the end, because I just want to pick up some things that, that uh, people, or that may be confusing to people, or because chapter four gets a bit just, you know, here's a bunch of things that aren't necessarily tied together. So inventory is mentioned, and really I think the takeaway for us here is that it's like GAP, right, for tax. It really does not differ from GAP. We use the lower, lower of costs in market, um, the only thing tax really says is when you can use specific identification, which is, you know, product by product, put the full costs in there. When you can, you must, right? GAP does not say you have to. It says you can choose, but um, tax says if you can, you have to. But for the most part, and when you can't, oh, sorry, when you can't, which is, you know, most, but depending on the nature of the assets, when you can't, then most people end up using FIFO. There are exceptions, and, and LIFO is allowed, but in very rare circumstances, so we don't really need to think about it. Okay? Then really, after that, I mean, there's other stuff in Chapter 4, but it's really not that important. What is important, though, is for us to really fully understand deductions. So the whole point of this is... When, when is an expense of a business deductible? And it's really not that confusing, right? I mean, the, the, the answer you can give and be right almost all the time is when it is incurred to gain or produce income. Okay, and this the important thing here is that this is in expectation, right? So... You can incur an expense and hope that it will generate revenue, and that may not happen. But if your intention or your expectation was that you spent that money with the with the the sole purpose of gaining, that's a G, of gaining to gain or produce income, then it's going to be deductible, right? The only we have these exceptions that we talked about actually in the last video: not capital, not personal and it has to be reasonable but really when it comes down to it this is all we need to know about whether things are deductible or not was it was it spent for that purpose then on, we end up the things we end up with in section 18 um, these all these things that are listed under the heading of things that are disallowed or limited um, is basically saying okay Yes, it's true. If you incur it to um, gain or produce income, then it should be deductible. However, here are a bunch of places where we are going to make a pronouncement that sounds like um, it was made in medieval times. No deduction shall be made. Okay, and so let's just look, and I'll, I'll, I won't write a whole lot here. I'll just talk so um, and these are all referenced so 4226 talks about reserves and for our purposes that's contingent liabilities the tax act is not like the accounting treatment of contingent liabilities which is you know nothing has been paid we're just going to accrue something in case some in case it's paid well tax says no thank you 
club dues. So we've met this one uh, already, and it's just a, a specific, um, more of a social policy, one would think, you shall not deduct club dues for, that you pay on behalf of your employees. For cars, all we do, and I, I know cars, <laughs> here's another thing about cars, you go, how many things can we do about cars? This is just, uh, sorry, when the employer is paying, so the employee owns the car, I'm just writing down these limits, when the employee owns the car, so that's important to note, if you're going to reimburse them, so this is basically the other side of that allowance that we learned about on the employee side. When you're going to give them this allowance, the max you can give them is when it's based on kilometers, 52 cents. If you give them more than that, we're not going to allow you to deduct more than that. And so that's for the first 5,000 and then 46 after that. But basically all we need to know here is that they cap it. So you can't say, okay, we'll reimburse our employees um, $100 per kilometer and basically get a get a deduction for us and a small income inclusion for them you can't do it okay penalties and interest so this is really anything that you have to pay to the oops, to the CRA we are just gonna say no you're not gonna get any tax relief to that for that okay just a specific exclusion um, we, we talked about actually yes in the online thing yesterday uh, this home office can't create a loss, so you can you can deduct. Um, can't create or make worse a loss. Okay, so this is one limit we put on it, and then the last one. So I haven't been good about keeping up these numbers, so you can fill them in and go to your textbook. But accrued expenses in forty two forty two thirty six. Really, if you have a genuine liability, you can accrue under tax. So if you owe somebody money, but there's there hasn't actually been cash change hands, you can have a deduction for that if it's genuine. The issue really arises when there are related parties. Because I we can start moving income between taxpayers and and getting preferential rates or 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 deferral because we we're we're working together, right? We we have each other's interests at heart because we're related. And so these two things are basically unpaid amounts. And so in general, all we say is you can have it can remain unpaid for two years. After that, it comes back into income. And then for salaries or bonuses to again to a related um, somebody who's related to the corporation, it has to be paid within 180 days. Okay, so if you don't do so, if you do those things, then absolutely you can accrue before you pay. But if you don't um, pay within this, these time frames, then we're going to include it. Okay, now section 4239 of the textbook. So these are hopefully everybody's clear. These are textbook references, not not uh, income tax act references. We have met these things that get limited. So meals and entertainment. Um, and I think everybody just sort of knows this one. 50% is included. Interest on car loans. Okay, so very specifically, if you b borrow money to buy a car, you can deduct a maximum of $300 a month. So this is just consistent with that $30,000 cap that we see on the CCA side. It's basically saying if you go out and buy this a very, very expensive car, we're only going to... Um, um, give you tax relief for uh, a, at a cap of $300 a month. And so actually in, in the law, that number is 250. Administratively, it's been changed to 300. And, and so these numbers rise as, um, as needed as, well, actually they don't really rise as needed, but they arise when somebody finally gets around to saying, hey, that number should be higher. So right now the lease amount um, is $800 a month. Okay, so those are just set by statute and that we're going to cap you and it's consistent with the, the as we've seen on the cost side okay so the last thing that we have to think so all we've really done here just to just recap all we've really done is say you can deduct whatever you want with some exceptions and i have definitely not listed all of the exceptions but as we have done the problems already and what the ones we'll continue to do in class 
those are the ones that we will hone in on and those will be our examples there's always going to be a nitpicky one somewhere but we were we're not going to concern ourselves with those we want to get the general principle of okay does it make sense and each of these sort of has their own policy reason for um, being not allowed but then what we need to talk about is this last thing in 4240 which talks about what's permitted and really what we're doing is we we are deducting um, what has been previously um, for lack of a better word disallowed so if we've added it back or we've said you know what under the under the current law if we don't have these specific permissions we've got these things that say you cannot deduct something but we need to add something basically the financial accounting way of doing it you can't do it that way so we need to put back in the tax so really this is things like CCA which and uh, and cumulative eligible capital which we will we will talk about so um, this, this is actually next class that we go in this so this is chapter 5 we'll go into some detail on this but the, this type of thing and then things like interest and uh, financing costs and um, uh, landscaping what else uh, so there's a, co a cost of licenses etc um, disability related things so these are all in headings in your textbook these things have to be specifically so we need these specifically allowed because by their nature because they are really capital right so what the what they're saying is you know interest is money paid to to um, take on bring in a large amount of capital usually to buy a capital asset so it seems like it's related to capital assets so we need to specifically say no we're gonna move that over to the income side okay so all these things are, are essentially saying um, we need to specifically include them because what we've said about we were so strong in our statement about income versus capital that we've actually shut out some things that uh, look capital and we want to kind of change their nature back to um, uh, back to income okay and then there's a couple of other things here so also under this list are things like conventions so when you send people to conventions you're you know making them better people and that's going to be and smarter and, and more knowledgeable that's going to all get into um, have long term so it seems capital but no we're going to make it income and you can write it off this year and then we have things like we've met actually in that first question that we did lease cancellation so this is when so you, we are the owner of the property and we are leasing it to someone else and then we say you know what we're gonna we're gonna terminate this lease well tax says you need to bring that in over the life of the deal that you signed okay so you can you can deduct it just not all in the in the year of the cancellation financial accounting treats it differently RPP payments right we have these caps of 18 percent or 22 970 and we're just you know you, you're welcome to put more in but we're not going to let you deduct more um, than those caps and uh, actually there are penalties for putting more in but that's the other side of things um, and I think that's it okay and then the last thing of course is the other side of all these things that we disallowed so reserves things like bad debts we technically um, income tax act says you know what we're, we don't like estimates and so we don't we don't want to use the financial accounting estimate but at the end of the day we're gonna put back in a tax version of that and for our purposes those are gonna be the same so they're really not we're not gonna they can be different don't get me wrong in real life but for our we'll consider them to be about the same so it's kind of gonna be an in and out of the same thing um, and then things like installment sales so if you if we have said you know what you can't you can't exclude that sale um, 
because it's coming in, it, it's, you're being paid periodically, then we'll allow you to reserve for the amount you have not yet received. And I think we can leave it at that, okay? So those are, again, we just want to have this idea of, in general, there's a, this idea that tax and accounting get along. When they don't, we have to work out the differences. So we're going to add it back to the financial accounting net income. And then in most circumstances, we're going to actually take away something else that tax comes up with that's related to that. Right, so it's really, it comes down to the timing differences.